So I'm very happy to be able to introduce Maya. And um, Maya is uh, the Associate Director of Learning and Community en Engagement at Ocean Networks Canada. She and her team lead Ocean Networks Canada's organizational commitment to meaningful ongoing partnerships with Indigenous communities. They develop formal and informal ocean learning opportunities for youth and for adults. Together with their parents, they are partners. They engage the community-based research, citizen science, and community-based monitoring to better understand ocean change and its impacts on coastal peoples. Maya's work takes her to communities on all three of Canada's coasts, the Pacific, the Atlantic, and the Arctic Oceans. She holds a PhD in computer science and a BSc in philosophy and computer science from Western University. In her spare time, Maya enjoys scuba diving, travel, reading, organic gardening, and any activity which allows her to spend time outside and on the water. So today we're going to have a very interesting presentation from Maya about communities on the front lines of climate change in the north of Canada. So I'm going to turn it over to Maya and thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much for that intro, Dwight, and thank you to the organizers of this. It's a real pleasure to be part of such an innovative event. So as Dwight said, the topic of my presentation today will be ocean change and climate change and how that's affecting communities in, in the north. So I'm going to share my presentation. Okay, hopefully my slides are shared now. Yes. Excellent. All right, so the title of my talk is Northern Communities on the Front Lines of Ocean Change. Before I get right into that, I wanna tell you a little bit more about myself and why this work is so important to me. I was born in the North of Canada in a small town called Elsa. And my hometown now is a ghost town. So it's interesting to think about communities in, in the face of change. Um, I grew up in the North and I've always felt um, a real affinity for Northern Canada. So when I was school age, so we moved to Ontario so that I could be closer to my family. And so that also drives my work is the importance of connecting with other people and the importance of family and culture. And nine years ago, I moved to the west coast of British Columbia to start my work at Ocean Networks Canada. As Dwight mentioned, my background is in computer science, and my work um, has taken me to a place where I can use technology to help us understand the changes that are happening in our ocean and on our planet. And so that is really nice to be able to connect all of these things. And I feel extremely privileged to be doing this work and especially the work that I do now with Indigenous communities. I really like this picture of our planet. So this was actually the first picture that was ever taken that shows the entire planet from space. And I think the importance of this image is that it really draws our attention to the ocean. So our planet being more than 70% covered in ocean, everything on our planet is driven by the ocean. Our weather, our climate is regulated, a lot of our food supply comes from the ocean. And so in talking about what's important on Earth, I think we all need to understand whether we live at the coast or we live inland, the importance of the ocean and how ocean change affects the entire planet. So in traditional ocean exploration, we normally think about using ships. And this of course could be a large research vessel like this, but it could also be a small canoe or a small fishing boat. So for the work we do at Ocean Networks Canada, we often use large vessels like the one shown here. And this type of expl exploration allows us to do all kinds of amazing things. 
we can use robots to go and see what's happening at the bottom of the ocean. We can take measurements from the ship and we can deploy equipment. But this type of work is very expensive. So for my organization, when we go to sea, by the time we have a large vessel like this and we equip it with a remotely operated vehicle, we staff it, we fuel it, it costs us more than a dollar a second to do this work. And not only that, the contribution of these vessels to our carbon footprint is very, very high. Uh, so we recently did an analysis at Ocean Networks Canada of all the ways that we are contributing um, to uh, emissions. And by far the most of our emissions comes from our ship-based operations. So Ocean Networks Canada, the innovative thing that has been developed is that Rather than being based only on ships, we've installed cables on the bottom of the ocean that connect scientific instruments, which can then relay their data in real time to the shore. And that data is made available to people around the world to analyze and use. And here's a picture of some of the innovative equipment that we have. This is a seafloor crawler called WALL-E. WALL-E is our, our version of the Mars rover, but WALL-E operates underwater and can be remotely controlled by research teams around the world. As WALL-E was developed in collaboration with researchers in Germany. And we have many, many different instruments like this. This is just one example. And so recently, Ocean Networks Canada has been working increasingly with coastal communities. So our roots are, are in the deep sea, but Due to the changes happening in coastal environments and the importance of understanding what those changes are going to mean for people around Canada and around the world, we have installed these types of cabled installations and also started other kinds of monitoring and science and learning programs in coastal communities around Canada. And so I'm going to tell you today about some of the work that we've been doing with Northern Partners. So this is a schematic of a cabled observatory. So you can see, get an idea of what it might look like. So you can see there's an instrument platform and it has the ability to connect to other instruments on the seafloor. And in this case, we're showing that there's a, a camera on with lights. So these cabled observatories are very good for monitoring the long-term in fixed locations. We can collect measurements many times per second with these instruments and send them in real time to the shore. In Cambridge Bay in the Canadian Arctic, we have one of these installations. And this is a picture of what the platform looks like with some of the instruments labeled on it. These instrument platforms are flexible. So when we want to add a new type of instrument because a new measurement becomes important or a new innovative technology is developed, we can recover the platform and we can deploy these new instruments. And the way that we do these deployments and maintenance is with community members. So in this picture, we have local residents from Cambridge Bay. We have um, members of the Arctic Research Foundation who helped us in the deployment. We have Ocean Networks Canada staff and we have students. So everything we do in small communities is a collaborative partnership effort. So the topic of this talk is really our changing climate and the effects on the oceans and most importantly, the effects on communities. So I'm going to give you a little bit of background about climate change in Canada and what we've been experiencing. Just this year, Canada published a really comprehensive report called Canada's Changing Climate Report. And this report is all based on um, data that's been collected with some projections for the future as well. So one of the key findings in the report is that between 1948 and 2016, in Canada, the average annual temperature increase is 1.7 degrees for Canada as a whole. However, this is actually less than what's happened in northern regions where we've measured a 2.3 degree Celsius increase in temperature over that time period. This is very dramatic. When you compare it to the Paris Agreement targets for limiting global temperature change to two degrees and pursuing efforts to limit it to 1.5 degrees, you can see that Canada is already over those targets in our contribution. 
And so looking at what's happening in Canada, we are already seeing some dramatic effects, particularly in the north. I'm going to show this in a couple of different ways, and all of the figures that I have here are from this publicly available report. So this is a, a map now of the same data, but shown in a graphical form. And so the more um, orange and red the map gets, the greater the temperature increase. So this is annual observed changes. And first of all, you can see that everywhere in Canada, it's getting warmer. But it, particularly when you look at the northern regions of Canada, so the Yukon Territory where I was born, Northwest Territories and Nunavut, those regions are increasing even more than the south of Canada. And now I'm going to show it to you in a different way, which is divided by seasons. So in the top left, you see a, a map of the change that's been happening over that same time period from 1948 to 2016 in the winter. And then following that, we have winter, uh, spring, uh, summer, and autumn. So I want to draw you attention particularly to the winter map. So winter is changing far more dramatically than summer, and the north is changing way more than the south. So if you look at the scale, the um, last measurement that's shown on the scale is 4.5 degrees, and you can see that the change in Canada's north is at the far, far right of that scale in the winter. So as you can imagine, this is having huge effects on the people living in those northern regions. Another finding in the report is that precipitation is increasing in the north. And so this graphic here shows the um, percentage change in precipitation in different regions. And looking again at northern Canada, you can see that that's where the most dramatic changes are being experienced. So what I'm really interested in and what I think we all should be very interested in is the question of how these changes are affecting communities. So after all, when we talk about climate change, we talk about our planet and we talk about the ocean and we talk about the land. But in the end, the question is really about how these changes in climate are going to affect us as people living on this planet. Um, I'm pretty confident, 100% confident, in fact, that if we have dramatic changes that cause problems for humans to populate this earth, the planet is going to go on. So the question is really, what is climate change doing to us as a population? And what are we going to see in the future? So in order to better understand this, starting a few years ago, Ocean Networks Canada and other partners engaged in a project that we call Connecting Inuit Knowledge with Sea Ice Research to better understand conditions for sea ice freeze-up, breakup in three communities, Kugluktuk, Cambridge Bay, and Joe Haven, Nunavut. This map here shows the northern regions of Canada and the map is titled Inuit Nunangat, which means the Inuit homeland. So the Inuit homeland comprises 35% um, of Canada's land mass. It comprises 50% of Canada's coastline. And there are 51 communities represented. And as you can see, there are four different regions in um, Inuit Nunangat. So what I want to point out here, this region, which is home to 65,000 Inuit people with 50% of Canada's coastline. When you compare that to the whole population of Canada, which is just over 37 million, you can really understand that the Inuit people have proportionally a very large responsibility and interest in Canada's ocean environment. They are also experts at monitoring and observing changes in weather and in climate and in ice. And so that's what really this project was all about. So the three communities that we worked with are circled in yellow. So to the, on the Western side, Kugluktuk, Cambridge Bay and Joe Haven. And so what can I tell you about these communities? So first of all, looking at the map, we chose these three communities because they're, all three of them are on the western entrance to the Northwest Passage. So these communities 
are going to experience an increase in vessel traffic as more and more vessels try to navigate through the Northwest Passage and we see increased shipping. We also chose these communities because they had a high interest in investigating this question together with scientists from the South. This is a picture of Kugluktuk. Kugluktuk, its name means the place of moving water and it's located on the Coppermine River. 90% of the population is Inuit in Kugluktuk. There are about 1,490 people living there and it's located at 67 degrees and 49 minutes north. Here's a picture of the Coppermine River. And so the river is a very important tr transit um, roadway for people living there. And it's also a place where people do a lot of fishing. Here's a picture of Cambridge Bay. Cambridge Bay, um, its other name is um, Ikaluktuktiak, which means good fishing place. There's archeological evidence that people have been living in Cambridge Bay for over 4,000 years. Cambridge Bay is located on Victoria Island. Its population is 1,760 people, and it's located at 69 degrees and six minutes north. All three of these communities, of course, are above the Arctic Circle. Cambridge Bay is also very interesting because it's the location of the newly opened Canadian High Arctic Research Station that you see in the picture here. So this station has been built over the last few years and it was officially opened on August 21st of 2019. Well, this is very important for Cambridge Bay because this um, High Arctic Research Station can house up to 150 scientists and provides between 30 and 50 full-time jobs. So this has meant a fair amount of change for a community of 1,700 people. It's brought a lot of opportunity. Um, it's brought a lot of new people to this uh, community and also um, increases in traffic and shipping. So Cambridge Bay at this point is 83% Inuit. And then the third community that we work with is Joe Haven. And here's a picture of Joe Haven. Uh, so you may not realize it if you're not familiar with how these pictures look, but these are the waterfront homes. So in the background of the image is the, the frozen um, sea ice in front of Joe Haven. So Joe Haven's um, Inuktitut name means lots of fat or blubber, which is um, a reference to the high uh, number of marine mammals that are in this region. And Joe Haven is located on King William Island. Its population is just over 1,300 people. At 68 degrees north um, and 38 minutes, um, this picture was taken at midday, by the way. So a lot of the pictures I'm going to show are from the winter time. And uh, of course, in the winter, um, it's twilight a lot of the day. And um, Joe Haven is uh, unique among these three communities in that it has a very high percentage of Inuktitut speakers. So the further east you go in the Canadian Arctic, the more uh, native and current speakers of Inuktitut there are. And there are different dialect, dialects of actually Inuktitut, which is the um, overall language. So in Joe Haven, um, there are quite a lot of people that speak um, Inuktitut as a, a first language. And um, the other thing that is very unique about Joe Haven is this is the closest community to the recently rediscovered Franklin Expedition ships. And so Joe Haven has invested quite a lot in tourism. So this um, center that you see here is the um, Heritage Center in Joe Haven, where there's an entire exhibition dedicated to the uh, Franklin ships. And so this will be important later when we talk about effects of change. So the rest of the project partners, we have the three communities and then within each community, we've worked with members of the Hamlet, we've worked with the Hunters and Trappers Organization, the Katikmiat, which is the region, the Katikmiat Inuit Association, Youth Science Ambassadors, so young people that we've employed to engage other youth in the project, teachers and students, and then many, many community members. 
And within the project, we also partnered with um, Environment and Climate Change Canada and Canadian Ice Service, so government departments, universities, Fisheries and Oceans Canada, so again, government research, and the Nunavut Arctic College. The project was funded by Polar Knowledge Canada and a variety of other sources. So as I said in the beginning, this project is about sea ice. So first of all, let's talk a little bit about how can we understand changing sea ice. So there's different ways that we can find out what's happening. Um, first of all, we have observations. So observations are made by people about the environment. We're all observers of our, our environment, but the Inuit are particularly astute observers of changes in the northern environment and have been for thousands of years and continue to be. Measurements. So we make measurements and I'm going to show you some data in this presentation. And those allow us to quantify different environmental conditions. And then finally, we can create models. So from the data, we can make theories about how change is happening. We can use computers to derive trends. And then finally, we can make models which are developed from these observations and measurements to predict future or past environmental conditions. And this project uses all three of these. So first of all, I'm going to show you a little bit of local data so you can really get a feel of how we approach this work in each community. The examples that I'm going to show are from Cambridge Bay. If you remember that underwater platform I showed, it has one particular sensor on it, which allows us to measure the thickness of the ice. So that platform resides in Cambridge Bay uh, year round, which means it's there in the open water and there it's there in the frozen season. So these two graphs, the top one is showing measurements of ice thickness and the bottom one is showing measurements of water temperature. And these measurements were taken between uh, September 2012, when it was first deployed, up to the end of 2018. And what I want you to look at in the top, so the, the triangles are showing the thickness of the ice. So the maximum ice thickness we saw over the time period shown in the graphs is around two meters. But if you look very carefully at those green triangles, you can see that over the six years of measurement that are being shown here, the total thickness of the ice does have a downward trend. So six years isn't enough for us to say something about changing climate. Typically, we would look for a 30-year time series to be able to say anything really on a climate scale. But what we can see already is in the short time that we've been measuring the ice thickness in Cambridge Bay, there has been a change. And secondly, the um, graph that's showing water temperature, what we see there is uh, the summer and winter trends in, in water temperature. So that was six years of data. So let's zoom out a little bit and let's look at sea ice from a satellite view. So in this graph, you are seeing 30 years of ice extent data from satellites. So the figure on the left shows in September 2018, the white outline is showing the ice extent in September. The pink outline shows the average ice extent from 1981 to 2010. On the right hand side, you can see the same data now plotted as a graph. The blue line is showing the trend. And I think we can all see that there is a decreasing trend in the amount of sea ice. And so these are the large scale effects, but they've been noticed locally as well. And we'll talk about that further. So coming back now to Cambridge Bay, Environment and Climate Change Canada has been making ice measurements in Cambridge Bay for the last 60 years. So there is a community member in Cambridge Bay, he's still doing this now, who goes out on the ice on the bay in Cambridge Bay and manually augers through the ice and then takes a measurement of its thickness. So these measurements here are very local. They're from the bay and they're made by a person on the ice. And what we can see in this data as well, this is now 60 years worth of data, so a little bit longer time scale. The average from 1959 to 1999, that's the left-hand portion of the graph, was 211 centimeters. 
In 2003 to 2016, it went down to two, two meters and one centimeter, 201 centimeters. So there's a 10 centimeter decrease in the more recent years when you compare it to the longer average from the past. So let's keep looking at more data. How far back can we go here? So 70 years of air temperature data. This is also from Cambridge Bay. Now looking at the red line, that's showing the trend. And in this case, we can see that over time it is increasing. And in fact, looking locally in Cambridge Bay, there's a 2.5 degree increase over the time of this record. So if you remember before, I said that the entire Arctic was warming. You can see that locally in Cambridge Bay, we measure the same thing. So there's a significant warming of winter temperatures. But also looking at the black line, which is the actual temperature measurements year by year, you see that there's a lot of interannual variability. So it's sometimes above and it's sometimes below the trend line. And this is, of course, absolutely normal. And when we talk about weather versus climate, one always has to remember that the weather can change on a daily, monthly or yearly basis. But the climate, when we talk about climate changing, we're really talking about these long term changes. So now we have 70 years of data to think about and we can see some pretty clear evidence of climate change. But what if we want to go further back? What if we want to know what happened before? And so this is the importance of the work that we did in this project, which is the Inuit hold thousands of years of environmental data of how um, the climate is and how it was in Cambridge Bay. And I, I really like this picture. I have many pictures that I like, but I wanted to show this one in particular. So this is a, a joint university and government research team with our community guides. So third from the left in this picture is George Angahayatuk, who is a very knowledgeable hunter and guide in Cambridge Bay. And um, right before we took this picture, George told me, well, he asked me the question, he said, how could you survive for a night out here on the sea ice? And we are standing on the ice there. And I pretty much shook my head and said, I don't think I could, George, that's why you're here. And George told me that for him to survive for a night on the sea ice, what he would do is look for a region which had the right kind of snow, which he knows how to identify and I don't, for building a shelter. And then he would use a candle to make the shelter warm and he um, would be able to keep himself alive out there. So what I, um, that story really brought home to me is how no matter how many times I go out on the ice and no matter how many papers I read on it, I'm never going to hold that kind of knowledge that George and other community members and experts have about survival on the ice. And their um, very detailed knowledge of ice and snow is absolutely essential in understanding the way things are and the way things are changing. So in the project, we used many different ways of understanding what's happening. One of them was we had workshops where community knowledge holders told us what they had experienced, showed us where they went on the ice and places that had experienced change. We also did site visits. So this is on, on the Coppermine River, but we did the same thing in each of our community regions more than once. Um, so we went out with community members and we all talked together about places that were staying the same, places that were important, places that were changing. And we compared what we saw out on the land with what our data and our scientific reports were telling us. Here's an example of something that we saw. This is a, a crack in the ice near Cambridge Bay. And on the bottom right, there's a zoomed in view of what that crack looked like. So there's actually um, slushy open water there. And these cracks are a, a normal feature in the ice. So the ice in, in the region that we're working in is called landfast ice, which means that it's actually um, frozen right to the land. And so as um, during tidal cycles and temperature changes, the ice contracts and expands. And so these, these cracks um, form in the ice and they can open and close, become larger and smaller. Sometimes they can squeeze together and become large ridges. And so it was um, very interesting to talk about how these cracks are, are changing um, or not in the face of climate change. 
We also deployed instruments. So this is um, the white pole in the middle is a satellite transmitter for an instrument that goes through the ice and allows us to measure the ice thickness. So if you think about a person going out and measuring the ice thickness every day, we can also put in instruments that allow us to measure the um, thickness of the ice. And so community members and scientists can see on a daily basis how, ice, how thick the ice is in different places. And so again, this was done in collaboration with community members. Uh, they directed us to the place where they wanted this instrument deployed. Um, and we went out together with um, a scientist and government um, and community team. And finally, we held public meetings um, in each community. And so at the public meetings, one um, goal of the meeting was to let everybody know what we were doing, but it was also to hear from the community what they thought of this work and whether they had anything to contribute and whether there were other knowledge holders that should be included in the project. So now I want to talk a little bit about what we learned. So what did we learn together with the community partners? So the first really important takeaway is that southern species are moving north. We heard observations from people that they have seen trees where trees have never been before. So near Kogluktuk, there um, are places where, where very small dwarf trees are now growing. We heard also about um, community members who caught salmon. So catching salmon in the north is not at all usual. Um, normally they would have um, char is one of the principal species. So when they talked to us about salmon, people were both excited and they were kind of surprised um, by it. So excited in the sense that there might be opportunities that also come with our changing climate for people in the north. The next thing we talked quite a lot about is how the sea ice is changing. And so um, some of the observations that community members made and the effects that they're having are first of all, on the dates of sea ice freeze up and break up. We heard that sea ice freeze up is getting later and later and sea ice break up is getting earlier and earlier. In other words, the ice covered season is getting shorter. This has huge effects for community. The ice is used for transit, it's used for hunting, it's used for cultural purposes. And so the fact that the ice season is getting shorter means that people have uh, less and less time to <clears throat> make use of that valuable resource. Also with sea ice, what we heard was a lot of information about how um, the ice is actually becoming less predictable. It used to be in these regions that the ice would start freezing up, it would freeze, and then that was it for the winter. So it would become frozen and it would be relatively stable. So when somebody went out on the ice and they discovered a, a route or they took a route that it was known to be um, good and they came back and reported to the community, it's frozen over, you can travel this route now, uh, it would stay that way. With climate change, there the communities are reporting that there's cycles in, for example, in the freeze up period where the ice is freezing and then thawing and then freezing and then thawing. So for one, this creates much rougher ice, but the other thing is the ice is not as predictable. And this has the effect that some um, traditional knowledge is not as applicable as it was before. And this means that the elders who are typically the um, first people out on the ice and the ones who um, can tell that when the ice is safe to travel on, their knowledge, um, because the ice is changing, is not always as relevant as it used to be. And what this means is that there are safety concerns in the community about traveling on the ice. And so even if maybe the ice actually is safe, because we're reliant on the expertise of the elders um, to tell us when the ice is safe, if their observations um, if they're not confident in telling the community that the ice is safe, then people are less likely to travel. So we also heard quite a lot about changes in weather. And so, um, first of all, there was an observation that the sky is getting grayer. So what does this mean? Uh, for one, the sky being um, grayer was is not as beautiful. So people lamented that um, the bright, open, sunny days of the past are becoming fewer in the winter. And 
in terms of weather, this means that there um, is more precip precipitation and more storms. And again, it's less predictable. Um, finally, I want to talk about vessel traffic. And so vessel traffic is increasing. And I'm going to show you some numbers of how it's increasing. And then I want to talk a little bit about what this is meaning for communities. So in Cambridge Bay, we have been um, monitoring vessel traffic since 2014. And so this is actual data that I'm showing you that Ocean Networks Canada has collected. So in, um, two in 2014, we uh, detected 19 vessels passing by Cambridge Bay. So what you're looking at on, on the picture is a satellite image of Cambridge Bay and all the colorful lines are vessel tracks in and out of Cambridge Bay. So 19 in 2014. In 2015, that increased to 28 vessels. 2016, 36 vessels. 2017, 41 vessels. And 2018 and 19, um, in 2018, we had uh, some equipment failure, so we don't have a complete record there, but 2018 was a very unusual year. So there was um, ice that actually blew in from the prevailing winds from the north and prevented a lot of ships from coming in. So the total number in 2018 is likely less than 2017. And 2019, we recorded 52 vessels. So again, we went from in 2014, 19 vessels to this year when we recorded 52. So that's a very big increase in a short amount of time. So what does this mean for the community? So first of all, the year that um, in 2018, I told you about Joe Haven and the um, exhibit center based on the Franklin expedition. So these communities are looking to increased vessel traffic and the potential for tourism by cruise ships as an economic opportunity. In 2018, both Cambridge Bay and Joe Haven were expecting seven cruise ships to arrive. Because of the ice that came in, none of those seven cruise ships could come into the community. So what that meant is that all the artisans and the people that had been um, preparing for these tourists to come, they'd worked throughout the year to create um, handicrafts and different things that could be sold. The community was ready. So they um, were not able to <laughs> benefit from that. And so this is another message about climate change. Um, we know that there are general trends happening. So in this case, we know that sea ice extent is decreasing and the ice covered season is getting shorter, but that doesn't mean necessarily that every year will be like that. So again, the interplay between weather and climate, some years are going to be colder and some years are going to be warmer and the overall trend might be getting warmer, but we might have a cold year in between. And um, so for communities, when they're planning their adaptation strategy and they're trying to understand what the future will look like in climate change, we also have to plan for the, um, the different environmental factors that lead to some years being um, above or below the general trend. So also on the topic of, of transportation, the changes in ice, are, um, have a widespread effect. Um, so this picture here is from Cambridge Bay. So Cambridge Bay every year builds an ice road across the bay. So if we're not able to depend on the ice as a means of transport, that means that we're um, going to have a lot of routes cut off. It'll increase dependence on air traffic and it'll decrease people's ability to travel quickly and to visit others. Traveling by snow machine or um, Skidoo is one of the main um, forms of transit. So again, this is extremely important for um, hunting, for transportation. Um, and I want to repeat a, a story that was told by um, Beverly McSagic, who's the manager of the Hunters and Trappers organization in Cambridge Bay. Uh, so in 2015, near Cambridge Bay, an, uh, an icebreaker came through. So when the ice was thick enough to go out on the snowmobiles, um, a ship has, had gotten trapped and so an icebreaker came through and it, it broke a track through the ice. So in the meantime, um, Beverly's family members had been headed out 
to the mainland on their hunting trip. And fortunately, they had to come back to Cambridge Bay to resupply. But if they hadn't, they wouldn't have been able to go through um, the track, the, the route that they were planning because of this icebreaker coming through. So when we're thinking about large ships transiting, we're not thinking so much about these small um, vehicles like snow machines that also use those highways. And so what would we do here in the south if our highway traffic was interrupted? It causes a big problem and it's no different than that in the north. So this picture is um, showing some of the other um, transport methods people use. So in the back, you can see traditional sleds that are being towed by snowmobiles. And uh, this picture is from Joe Haven. So what I also wanted to show you with this picture is there's very um, gray cloudy skies here. And at the sort of in the mid um, ground on the left hand side, that is the community of Joe Haven. So it kind of gives you an idea when you're out there of what it actually looks like on the ice and how important the ability to navigate safely is. So that's a little bit about our project. And um, let me say a few words about where we're going next. So for one, we're not finished all the data analysis for this project. So we are going to work further with our community partners to really understand um, everything that's been said. And we're going to produce a report together, which can then be used by the community and by scientists to understand how the changes that we have, that we know are happening through either data or observations are affecting community members and what should be done next. Um, the communities themselves are very interested in having this information so that they can use it for their own decision making. We've also um, implemented some training programs, again, with communities. So one is a course in instrument technology, which is now offered in three places in Canada. And importantly, um, it's offered at the Nunavut Arctic College in Iqaluit. And our objective in um, developing and offering this course is to make sure that young people in um, these training programs have access to the same kind of um, monitoring technology that scientists use um, and that Ocean Networks Canada uses so that more communities can do the types of measurements that um, scientists in the south are doing. We also have a program that involves youth and this program um, is a, a year-round programming uh, program we employ young people on a part-time basis to facilitate educational programs and mentor other youth in the community who have an interest in ocean science and in its connection with Indigenous knowledge. Uh, the two pictures um, on the left-hand side, uh, hidden in that picture in the center wearing the brown, um, light brown jacket is Mia Utokiak, who was our first youth science ambassador in Cambridge Bay. And she's brought a group of students down to the dock to see the community observatory. And on the right hand side was our most recent um, intake of youth science ambassadors from the north. Um, and we're doing training with them in Victoria. We've also started a, another monitoring program in the Eastern Arctic in Iqaluit to take ocean property measurements. And um, what you're looking at in this picture is us testing our equipment together with our community partners. And we also um, have youth contributing to our measurements. Uh, in this picture, we have um, two young people in Cambridge Bay who are taking snow measurements. And finally, this work does extend all around the world. Um, the, some of the change being experienced in Canada's north is really similar, for example, to the, the same types of issues are coming up for Pacific Island nations and so on. And so um, we have started working with an international community of Indigenous people who are connected to ocean monitoring and ocean change. And this picture here is from the Ocean Ops Conference, which occurred this September in Honolulu. So this is a once a decade conference whose objective is to talk about the next 10 years of ocean monitoring. And Ocean Networks Canada and other partners brought together an international indigenous delegation with 53 members to attend this conference and advise the ocean monitoring community 
what interests of Indigenous people should be forefront um, in planning the next decade of ocean monitoring priorities. And we're continuing our work now with this delegation. So lastly, in terms of what's next, I want to mention some actions that we can all take with respect to this. So first of all, as scientists, I think it's extremely important, it's imperative for us to look to communities as our partners. These communities have a wealth of knowledge and experience that's essential for us to understand ocean change. And in fact, when we're looking at what impacts the change has, we can only do this in collaboration with communities. So for community members, what I want to leave you with is that really, um, you are the experts in your community and what impact these changes are having and what can be done. And so my, um, what I'd like to encourage for community members is that you speak up and you share your experience. So traditional, traditional and local knowledge is really essential. And there um, is so, are so many opportunities to lead work in your community. And there are many partners in the South, like myself, who are, are very interested in working together. Um, I think this is a problem that we can only um, attack when we work collaboratively together. And then finally, for everybody else who might be watching this, so climate change is disproportionately affecting the polar regions on our planet. So the changes due to climate change are happening now and they're dramatic. So the experience of these Northern communities is essential for everybody on the planet to pay attention to. We need to learn from the resilience and the wisdom of our Northern peoples um, so that we can all understand what we will need to do to face the changes that um, are going to happen across the entire planet. And I'm going to end my presentation with this picture. So this is um, a picture of a Southern researcher and a Northern expert together on one of our site surveys. And what I really love about this picture is that unless I tell you, you, you can't tell who's who. And to me, that's what this is all about. It's not about who's from the North and who's from the South and who went to university and who learned on the land. What it's about is working together to understand the changes that are happening and hopefully making some friends while we're doing it. So that's the end of my presentation. Um, and I hope that maybe some people have some questions or things that they want to contribute to the discussion. But I, I want to um, again thank the organizers of the, this um, event to have the opportunity of speaking in this virtual forum. Well, thank you very much, Maya. That was uh, uh, amazing. It's such uh, beautiful photos and helps you get a sense of trying to, to go to such a remote and looks like very cold place on our planet. I'm, I'm wondering, Maya, maybe you could um, stop the streaming and then we can see you bigger on the screen. There you are. And um, there are a number of questions that came in uh, while you were speaking. And uh, maybe I'll start with a question that came from Angel who's watching on YouTube. She actually tuned in to watch a, a section on sharks and marine mammals, but because of time differences, it got mixed up, but she stayed to watch. And uh, she had a question about um, commenting that many people do not understand the difference between the changes in the weather uh, versus the climate. And she commented on the need for uh, more science literacy in public schools. And you, you touched on that. And I'm wondering if uh, this distinction between weather and climate is something that's um, easier for people in the North to understand. Um, first of all, I think that's a really important um, comment and question. Um, this is something that often confuses the conversation about climate change. So when you hear somebody making a comment like, well, climate change can't possibly ha be happening because it's so cold out today, uh, this is exactly the kind of confusion that we see between the understanding of weather and climate. So I, I think the main thing to keep in mind is that climate observations are, are about long-term observations and they're about trends. 
So it, it's not about how it is today or how it's going to be tomorrow or what it says in the weather forecast. That's not climate. Climate is what the um, temperature measurements tend, for example, what the temperature measurements tend to be over a long period of time and whether or not those trends are increasing and decreasing. So I think um, it would be extremely valuable for us to have more understanding of that in, in the schools and in public education and in the media, because when we're all trying to um, make sure that everyone is aware of climate change and what it really means, that distinction and understanding is critical. Great, thank you. Um, a couple more questions came in. Uh, they're anonymous, but um, interesting questions. First one here, how do you uh, reconcile this social challenges of being indigenous in Canada nowadays with the progress of science in Northern communities? That's another really great question. Um, so, how am I going to talk about this? So first of all, I want to say that um, there have been some really great global advances in recognition of the um, important place that Indigenous people have everywhere in the world. And so, the, um, for example, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People is very clear in how it states um, Indigenous people's rights to um, the continuation of culture and rights to their land and the governance over their land. And so in, in Canada as well, we have the um, calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which also has some very strong language. Um, that um, commission was more so, um, well, the results of it came from Canada's dialogue with uh, survivors of um, residential schools in Canada. But the observations that were made in there stretched much further than just reflections on the school system. So um, when we think about these big and, and overarching um, calls to action that have been put out on a global and national um, level, it's really important for us working, say, in the sciences, that we understand the cultural and political context of the work that we do, because it's not just science when we're doing um, any kind of work that affects people and personally i don't know what work doesn't affect people we need to take those those people's place and understanding into account and so um, another a piece of work that really inspires me in my work in canada's north is the um, national inuit research strategy and so this is a, a document that was put together by the um, canada's governing um, organization for Inuit people in the north and it outlines how Inuit would um, need to be partners in research happen happening in Canada's north and I mean it's it's a long document with a lot of really valuable insight but the main um, takeaway from that document is that Inuit need to be full partners for research that happens in Inuit Nunungat and that means participating in the research design, participating in conducting the research, um, understanding and contributing to the results of the research. It means sharing in the funding. It means having access to training to be able to conduct the research. So for, for myself and the way of working that I really believe in and try to promote, it, it is this partnership concept where um, we all come to the table with something really valuable to offer and we need to put our heads together to look at the big, the big issue, which is climate change. And that takes all of us. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well said. Yes. Okay. Um, a, sort of a related question is, um, is there somewhere that this traditional knowledge, you mentioned traditional knowledge, mm -hmm. it, is there somewhere this is, this knowledge is kept and also, made available for all of us? Mm -hmm. So an interesting question. So where is this knowledge kept? So each community, it, they are the keepers of their knowledge from that community. So that's first and foremost something to say. And um, with now um, a lot of elders who grew up in a very traditional way. So in, in Nunavut, um, 
actually they don't need to be elders. I've met people of my own age who were born um, on the land in an igloo. So this is amazing to think that these changes were, were so recent that um, now um, most Inuit live in uh, these small communities, but previous to that, they were um, mostly nomadic and um, going into different regions when, whenever the seasons and uh, the um, hunting was good in different places. Anyway, um, so a lot of the knowledge resides in community, but one of the um, things that's happening now is as, as elders are, of course, aging and um, they are passing away. So it's very important for the communities that they have opportunities to capture and, and keep that knowledge from the elders. So I think the programs that, that um, are being led in those communities to make sure that information is transmitted from the older generation to the middle generation and the young generation, that's really essential. So then, secondly, for the rest of us, so like myself, who don't live in Nunavut, but um, work there, and this actually applies to other Indigenous communities as well, of course. Uh, so not, not all knowledge um, is suitable to be shared. Some knowledge is really just for the community. But of the knowledge that the community is willing and wants to share, there are some social platforms that are coming out now. Um, so uh, I was just, I just came from the Arctic Net, Arctic Change Conference in Halifax, and there was a big announcement of a social media sharing platform called Siku, which is now, it's publicly available and um, something that you can uh, just Google and look up. So um, Siku is the Inuktut word for sea ice, and it's spelled S-I-K-U. S-I-K-U. <laughs> S I K U, and and Siku is a um, a sharing platform for exactly this. It's for science data, but it's also for traditional knowledge. So there there are a number um, of these kinds of uh, sharing platforms that are emerging now, where communities are um, putting out their knowledge, but also um, looking for ways to collaborate with other people that have relevant information, like scientific monitoring data. Oh, yeah, that's very interesting. I've, I've just um, posted that in the chat in, in case people want to Google Siku. <laughs> Is it an acronym? No, it's actually, it's a, the um, Inuit language word for sea ice. A sea ice, I see. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Mm -hmm. So um, one more question here. Are natural resources exploitation in the Arctic affecting local communities? And have you seen this in the communities that you've been visiting in the North? Mm -hmm. um, yes, uh, yes, they are, of course. Um, the, the three communities that we work in, they're not communities, for example, that are near a big mine or that kind of thing. So um, in Nunavut, the, the Inuit um, in the Nunavut land claim settlement, the Inuit control all the decisions about the land rights in, in Nunavut. So there is self-governance of the land. So Inuit decision makers are involved in all the decisions about resource exploitation um, in, in Nunavut at least. And so that's a, a really um, positive thing about the Northern region in Canada, which isn't applicable to everywhere in Canada. Um, so the decisions that are, are made around resource exploitation, um, how they affect communities is taken into strongly into account in Nunavut. Um, there's an, an organization as well called Nunavut Impact Review Board that reviews every proposal for use and development. Um, and they look at everything from human factors to economic potential um, in making those decisions. So I think, um, I actually think that the way that that's approached is is really very good in Nunavut because, of course, it it does have effects. Um, like vessel traffic is one example. Mm -hmm. So as we have increased shipping, that is going to affect communities. Um, it'll affect uh, like the ice as well. So there's there's other regions, not where I'm working, but on Baffin Island, for example, where they do have shipping in and out of mines year round, and so they actually keep 
waterways open. So they there are areas where ships are going through with icebreakers and, wow. and so it, it's just never frozen over there. So for a community to enter into a, de a decision like that, they would have to weigh all the different factors. What's the benefit in terms of employment and economic development versus affecting caribou migration and affecting human use of, of the ice. Um, yeah, and I guess another thing to mention is um, commercial fishing. So that's something that as we see um, changes perhaps in the species um, that are present and the um, <clears throat> the ecosystem that supports the species that are there, that is definitely going to have effects as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I think my summary of all of that is yes, of course, resource exploitation does have a very large effect on people um, but what's really good is to make sure that people who are going to be affected have a say. And I think that Nunavut has some pretty good um, organizational support for doing that. Well, that's good to hear. Yeah. And uh, maybe Nunavut uh, can be um, sort of a, a model or a leader you know, for other communities that are uh, struggling with these issues in the mm -hmm. North and other places around the world. Yeah. And that's something I, I mentioned that, that we were at that Ocean Ops conference. And that's something that came out very strongly there is that other countries look to Canada as a leader in how we partner with Indigenous peoples for science and over resources. And I know we have a long way to go here in Canada. So we need to do a lot of work still on reconciliation and on um, indigenous land claims and so we have a lot of work to do but compared to some other places at least we're trying here <laughs> <laughs> yes keep trying yeah <laughs> <laughs> well um maya we've we've reached the end we've actually gone over the end of your of your time and but your presentation has been wonderful and <clears throat> one thing i'm very happy to know is that it's been recorded and so this will be made available through Virtual Blue Cop 25 and um, you know, all the presentations from this uh, unique event going around the world in 24 hours will all be available. So I'd like to thank you very much, Maya, for, for this uh, very interesting and beautiful presentation. And um, we look forward to hearing more about your work and successes in the future. So thank you very much. Thanks so much, Dwight. <laughs>